usually in health, health economy, <laughs> what health economists can even dream of. Uh, he holds a Bachelor of Science in Health Policy and Administration from Pennsylvania State University. First, an MA in Economics from University of Michigan, and he has done his PhD in Economics and Health Services Organization and Policy from University of Michigan. His current research focuses on measuring cost associated with diseases and measuring cost effectiveness primarily. Uh, much of his recent research is around that. And in particular, among various uh, groups of diseases, he has been working a lot on eye care and uh, the efficiency or inefficiency of the markets and in terms of service delivery, et cetera. So he primarily teaches around economics of decision-making, business leadership, human values, and frameworks for fundamentally analyzing healthcare markets, both from the demand side and the supply side. And but the way I can uh, understand it is that he primarily works in terms of increasing welfare uh, by both changing the demand side and the supply side of the market by creating a better matching, a better system to match both of these two sides. And he has multiple uh, projects. I am not going through all of them. There are just too many to enumerate here. And uh, uh, his, I, I was looking at the you know uh, present set of slides. Uh, I think there is a lot of learning for all of us. I would not uh, give away the details, but fundamentally, I really what I I thought my preliminary takeaway from that was how to think about eye care and from an economics perspective. And this is something that we have been discussing in the present forum for quite some time uh, from various perspectives, especially from Global South, uh, you know, uh, from the point of view of the Global South and what are the specific problems that we see. But at the end of the day, we can all map them into basic economic principles. And that is something that I think he will be telling us a, you know, a lot about. And I really think we have a lot to learn from the presentation. So we really look forward to it. Thanks, Kevin, for giving us time again, uh, and we really appreciate it. So the floor is yours. Uh, we have around one hour. So feel free to take questions on the fly, uh, or if you want to postpone them and answer them towards the end, that's also perfectly fine. Uh, for the uh, rest of the uh, audience, uh, feel free to write up your questions in the chat box, and uh, Kevin can take them up as his head speech. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you very much for the invitation to speak today, uh, and I really appreciate it. Uh, just last week, I actually spoke to a group in the U.S. about a similar but not identical topic, really trying to help people understand how to incorporate economics into advocacy. Um, economics and research, economics and advocacy, they do go hand in hand. Um, so let me uh, pull up my slides. And as was mentioned, I am happy to take questions anytime throughout, and I'll try to keep an eye on it. But certainly in India, if I Miss a question that somebody has uh, tried to try to let me know about. Do uh, do feel free to let me know. All right. So um, the title for today really is trying to do some looking back at some of the work that I've done. Although I've been working in the economics of eye care now for about twenty years, so there would be a lot to talk about if I talked about all of it. And then also to think about looking forward and thinking not just about you know simple microeconomics and eye care or simple burden of disease measures and eye care, but really trying to look at the breadth of what's in the second line on this title, the business and economics of eye care and health. And eye care relates to eye health, but eye care also relates to health in general in many ways. So when I think about this, where do I begin? I begin by first thinking about, you know, maybe some of you have had an economics course and others of you have not. I know in the US when I'm talking to audiences that are clinical or advocacy, many of them are familiar with economic terms, but many are not economists. And so here I have a list of things that I like to think, you know, or I've been told over the years that economics is often perceived as lots of math, only focused on efficiency and profit. Everyone's in it for themselves. And it's just about property rights. And, you know, a very simple definition, the study of how people make decisions about scarce resources. But on the right hand column, I have what economics has the potential to be. We need to communicate about resources. We need to be able to say, here's one way of using them, here's another way of using them. Let's choose the better way. And economics doesn't always answer what the better way is, but it can help us to talk about that. 
uh, we consider not just efficiency, but the utility of the people making the decisions. What makes them, what goals do they have? Uh, we can consider stakeholders other than financiers rather than just focusing on profit. We have a unit in our business ethics class here at the business school where we talk about what we call stakeholder capitalism. And we think about the financiers, but we also think about the employees and the suppliers and the customers and the community that a business or healthcare facility is in. Uh, sometimes we think about altruism, sometimes we think about public goods, and really economics can be a reflection on how people use their money and their time, both of which are incredibly important scarce resources, uh, to benefit themselves and hopefully also to benefit their communities. When we look at the research in economics and business related to eye care and eye health, what do we find? So one thing we find is global or national impact. I mean, my very first study in this space was a study with Alan Foster, funded by Sightsavers way back more than 20 years ago, looking at the global impact uh, in terms of productivity loss related to blindness and vision impairment and projecting forward what might happen if Global Vision 2020 was successful. So you see these reports at a global level and a national level. Sometimes rather than blindness or vision impairment in general, it'll be a very specific disease. Or we did something recently for IAPB that was two diseases, mostly about cataract and refractive error. We could look at the cost of treatment or prevention. We could look at lost productivity because of society's failure to provide accommodation for those with vision impairment and blindness. And I'll talk about that terminology on a future slide. We often see people doing cost effectiveness or cost benefit studies, trying to assess what's the value of a new intervention or a new way of providing care or a new way of screening for vision problems. And then finally, since I switched from School of Public Health to a business school, really thinking about investment in sustainable business models for eye care. And that's one place where, you know, with reference in the introduction to the Global South, maybe what's an investment in a sustainable business model in the US is very different from investment in a sustainable business model in India, which may in turn be different from an investment in a sustainable business model in the interior, in the outback of Australia, which then is different from a sustainable business model in, say, sub-Saharan Africa. And so really focusing on not just how we can get, you know, convince NGOs to invest and convince governments to invest, but can we come up with a sustainable way for private industry to have a role in providing better eye care and fostering better eye health over time? Now, when burden is being measured, yeah, you know, what do we think about? So first of all, you know, is calling it a burden an inherently ableist phrasing? And we talk about better ways to phrase things in the United States quite a bit these days. But what is included when we think about the burden related to vision impairment and, and uh, blindness? So how much are we spending to treat conditions that might lead to vision impairment and blindness? How much does productivity change while people are alive? And to the degree that there's any association between vision impairment and blindness on the one hand and um, mortality on the other, what is the loss of productivity from people dying uh, prematurely? When we think about productivity change, you know, what should it be or what should it include? I remember the very first time I wrote about this, just referred to it as the productivity loss due to blindness. And that's the way a lot of people still write about it. I got um, scolded actually quite, quite a bit by someone from the World Federation of the Blind. And I look back and her scolding was appropriate because she pointed out not everyone who is blind loses productivity. In fact, some are very productive in general. And so we talked about the potential productivity loss due to blindness. The key though, over time, uh, particularly again in the United States, as we see more and more people trying to figure out uh, a social justice approach to thinking about people with disabilities, um, we could refer to it as a productivity loss due to society's failure to accommodate those who are blind. Um, and that's just a different attitude in terms of where the responsibility for potentially trying to find a solution to the problem is. And really the responsibility is for society to figure out ways, uh, if possible, to make it accommodating and to enable people to be as productive as possible. And then uh, another question about what should be included or not is the value of productivity change for those who assist the individual with vision impairment. Um, and there's been lots of uh, references to one study from actually about three or four decades ago now, where someone just assumed that 10% of a normally 
sighted person's productivity would be lost to care for uh, someone who's blind. But there have been some more recent studies really trying to get at, you know, for unpaid care that's being given by individuals. How, how much does that cost society? Why does productivity change? Sometimes people who are visually impaired in a way that can't be corrected or blind are less likely to seek work. Among those who do seek work, they might find it harder to find work, so they're less likely to be employed. If they are employed, they may be working fewer hours. It could be a matter of transportation. It could be a matter of other things. And then obviously just individuals who are otherwise similar, except for the fact that they're blind, are sometimes paid less. And all of these are different features of the difference in productivity and importantly in the difference in the ability of individuals who are blind or visually impaired to, to sustain themselves if their wages are lower. And then when they are at work, sometimes people miss work more and that's absenteeism. And then there's also this term presenteeism, which is when you go to work, but you're not as productive in the workplace. Um, this is actually something that uh, comes up for eye conditions other than blindness. For example, individuals who have dry eye, there's not a whole lot of medical treatments for dry eye. They don't miss work very many days here in the United States, but when they are at work, they find it very difficult to be as productive as colleagues who don't have dry eye. And so that would be presenteeism rather than absenteeism. And that's not even one that's causing vision impairment and blindness so much as just discomfort that is related to vision. What are decision makers? When we present these data about economics and about cost effectiveness and about business cases related to eye health, what are decision makers really interested in? Sometimes they're interested in knowing, well, which condition has the largest impact on the economy? When we look at advocacy here in the United States and advocacy around the world, people will talk about, well, cancer costs the US healthcare system this much every year or diabetes costs the US healthcare system this much every year. And then we could talk about how much does blindness cost to the healthcare system and society in general every year. And sometimes among advocates, you feel like people are you know, trying to get precedence by saying, well, my disease costs more than your disease does. But decision makers are certainly interested in knowing how much of an economic impact does it have? We can measure it in absolute monetary units. We could measure it as a percent of gross domestic product in terms of thinking about you know, how it takes away from the ability of the society to be productive. Uh, but it is something that gets decision makers attention. Uh, and in particular, it's not just how much does it cost, but how much does it cost to change that impact? You know, For every dollar invested in changing that impact, do we get only 50 cents back or do we get two or three dollars back? And hopefully we get the two or three dollars back. When we're interested in cost, we could either be interested in the lifetime cost for an individual who becomes blind or visually impaired, you know, say a patient with age-related macular degeneration who becomes blind in their mid-70s, they're going to live another 10 years, what does that cost them and what does that cost society? And we could talk about that on a year-by-year -year basis in which it would be cash flow in business terminology, or we could try to calculate what in accounting is called a present value, which is just a fancy way of saying if we needed to fund that cash flow with money we had in the bank today and we knew what interest rate we could earn and we all agreed on that interest rate, then how much money would we need to have in the bank today to fund that cash flow over time? And then sometimes we're interested not so much in uh, lifetime costs, but just annual expenditures. How much does it cost each year for a person or society? Uh, and in India, I see that there's a question, and let me text chat as well as your question. Go right ahead. So uh, thanks, Kevin. So I was also wondering that uh, isn't the broader trade-offs between the present generation and the future generation is also a concern. So the reason I'm saying this is that, for example, currently in India, there is a lot of debate about pollution. And the question is exactly how to cut it down because higher output clearly is better for the future generation, but then it's also... It's very intertwined. So it's not only the, I, I think the point that I'm trying to get at is that on the present slide, broadly it refers to the evaluation of the current cost and benefit, whereas there can be potentially a spillover and a trade-off that the policymaker has to worry about for the future generation as well, no? 
Absolutely. That's a great question. And, and it's partially captured in how we calculate the present value related to that lifetime cost consideration. Um, you know, what uh, do we put a high value on the future or a low value on the future when we're calculating a present value? And that's just simple mathematical mechanics. If we put a lower value on the future, then all those future years expenditures will mean less as we look at them today. If we put a higher value on the future or a lower discount rate as the terminology is sometimes used, uh, then we will you know, account future, future expenditures more. I think what's important when it comes to blindness is that on the one hand, we could simply you know, do the adding up of cost for the individual, uh, you know, as, as we've been talking about, and simply the math of how much is a dollar spent today compared to spending a dollar tomorrow, or you know, obviously uh, it's not dollars everywhere around the world, but spending money today versus spending money tomorrow, how does that compare? But even more importantly, you know, particularly if we have a younger uh, working age adult providing informal care, unpaid care for an older adult with a vision problem, you know, not just how much is that worth today, but does that impact on that younger working age adult's ability to continue their career, to advance in their career? So there's many considerations in addition to just, you know, adding up the dollars spent year by year. But you're absolutely right. You know, thinking about how society is making those trade-offs and is there a way that's standard enough that we can say, well, this is, you know, the way it generally works or on the other hand, is it more that, um, you know, everybody sort of has their own, uh, their own approach and, um, and it's very difficult to agree on a unified way that we could all say, at least for making public resource allocation decisions, this is how we should think about it. All right, let me talk about a few other background things then. Uh, so, you know, we talked about some of this already, the present value concept. Inflation just means that if we've been ca you know, capturing data for five years or 10 years, and we're looking at what money was being spent five or 10 years ago, sometimes that's how it gets reported in the literature. Sometimes that's how, you know, just our data are. We need to talk about what we're, what we're looking at in terms of today's expenditures. Uh, the perspective, whose spending are we worried about? The patient's spending, the government's spending, uh, healthcare facilities spending, and then what time horizon? Or again, are we talking about just this year, the next five or 10 years or the lifetime of the, of the uh, individuals? And I see that Payal posted a question, uh, do we give preference to annual and lifetime expenditures calculation depending on the type of health condition that is chronic or short term? And certainly, uh, you know, when we're talking about vision impairment and blindness, we're, we're generally going to be trying to capture lifetime, although we are interested in what it costs on a year by year basis. But you're absolutely right. There are some conditions if we were looking at conjunctivitis uh, or pink eye, as it's more simply known most times here in the United States. Um, you know, that's a that's an incidence cost. You know, the, the, the child, usually child gets it sometimes it's their parent. But child gets it, you treat the child, they miss a couple of days of school, the parent might miss a day of work, there's something to treat it with. That's all very short term. We don't need to talk about the lifetime cost related to an eye infection. Um, we do need to talk about the lifetime cost when it comes to when it comes to vis you know, vision impairment that can't be corrected and blindness. Uh, and so I think that's one of the reasons to spend at least a little bit of time focusing on the, on the concepts. Great question. Um, when we think about um, costs, then there's different types of studies, and I won't read the list here because I'm going to have a slide on each of them. You know, sometimes we just do a cost study, literally a costing. So what is the amount of monetary value or account for the monetary value of the resources used? And of course, the resources include people's time or labor, uh, you know, investing in new capital goods and how do we you know, appropriately account for those? And then consumables, among many, uh, transportation often in uh, eye interventions for eye care. And just, you know, reporting out, this is how much it costs because it's important for decision makers to know. It can be important for funders to know. It can be important for people who are thinking of their next project to know. Many different people simply need to know the cost, although often that's reported before you get to a peer-reviewed paper, perhaps in a white paper, or perhaps on a website, um, because generally speaking, unless there was something particularly challenge, challenging about calculating the cost, uh, the cost alone is, is rarely rises to the level of something that gets published in a peer-reviewed journal article. 
Now, we do have this concept of cost minimization. Cost minimization is two interventions with the same outcomes. And then if all we were interested in was an economic point of view, we would simply ask, well, which one uh, cost less if they had the same outcomes? The key here is rarely are we only interested in an economics point of view. We might be worried about equity. We might be worried about uh, you know, the quality of the care that's being given. We might be worried about uh, age distribution in terms of equity. So there's many other things in addition to just the economics and making sure that we know exactly what we mean when we talk about two interventions having the same outcomes. Is it exactly the same? Is it not statistically significantly different? Is it the same across all dimensions of outcomes or is there one primary outcome that we're interested in? When we move forward from that, sometimes we see in the literature what's called a cost consequence analysis. So you measure the costs, you report on multiple consequences and leave it to the decision maker, a policymaker, a non-governmental organization, decision maker, some other type of funder to decide how to make the comparison. So, you know, if one intervention costs less and is better on all consequences, then obviously, again, from a purely economic point of view, go with that one. But again, reminding ourselves, is it always the pure economics that we're interested in? That's important question number one. And then important question number two is, you know, is it ever the case that one is truly better on all of the consequences? Or if you have one that's, you know, more costly and better on the consequences, then how much better does it have to be? on each of those consequences. And the consequences could be, you know, getting more screenings done, uh, you know, getting more kids to have glasses if it's an uncorrected refractive error screening or myopia related intervention, a uh, number of things could play out there. Then cost effectiveness is the next type of study, it gets a little more complicated. We're gonna compare costs. We're gonna think about what we as the researchers believe is the primary outcome. And then, I always like to remind people if one alternative costs less and has more of the uh, primary outcome, then again, from a purely economic point of view, go with that one. Um, if the alternative costs more and gets us more of that primary outcome, then you know, essentially what we're asking is, is it worth spending the extra money to get more of that outcome? And the researcher or the advocate doing the research gets to decide what is the primary outcome that it's going to base the research on? The decision maker ultimately then has to decide, is it worth spending that amount of money to get the extra outcome? So is it worth spending you know, $100 to avoid a case of blindness? Is it worth spending $500 to avoid a case of blindness? Is it worth spending $5,000 or $50,000 to avoid a case of blindness? And does it depend on whether it's just a case of blindness or something related to retinopathy of prematurity versus something related to age-related macular degeneration, would, be, would we be willing to spend different amounts to help those two populations avoid blindness? Questions that you know, someone has to answer along the way. Then we hear about cost utility, and this gets reported quite a bit in the literature. Uh, we're still measuring costs. That's constant throughout all of these types of studies. We're going to summarize morbidity and mortality with one measure. You see two different measures in the literature. You see quality adjusted life years and disability adjusted life years. With quality adjusted life years, we're supposed to accumulate quality of life. So it's a good thing to have more quality adjusted life years. With disability adjusted life years, we're trying to avoid the experience of disability. So we're trying to have less disability adjusted life years. But once again, two things that I wanna emphasize. If one alternative is better on your quality or disability adjusted life year measure, whichever one you're using, and it costs less, once again, from a purely economic point of view, that's what we want to do. However, usually the one that you know, is more effective in terms of qualities or dollies also costs more. And so once again, the decision maker is going to have to make a fundamental decision. Do they want to spend what amount of money do they wanna to spend to improve quality or disability adjusted life years for their population they're making a decision for? The researcher's sort of role in this is A, deciding to do a cost utility study in the first place, and then B, deciding what measure to choose to get at quality adjusted life years or disability adjusted life years. There are some pretty standard approaches to the calculation of disability adjusted life years. 
trying to measure this concept of health-related quality of life, particularly as it relates to vision, is very complicated. There are some instruments that try to measure health-related quality of life just related to vision. There are other instruments that try to measure health-related quality of life that include vision as a specific measure, but are trying to measure quality of life more generally. And there's some measures that are very popular to use that don't list vision as a specific category, but if your vision limits your mobility, it would pick that up. If your vision limits your ability to do your usual activities for someone of your uh, age and, and gender, for example, it would pick that up. If your vision problems are associated with pain or result in depression and anxiety, it would pick those up, but they're not measuring vision directly. And so the key is, again, some countries have very specific amounts they're willing to pay to gain quality adjusted life years and avoid disability adjusted life years. Others don't have it written into policy. But in one form or another, the researcher has to decide to do the study like this, how to collect the data to do the calculations, and then presents the calculations to the decision maker, who ultimately has control of the decision. Do we want to spend this amount of money to gain this amount of health for society measured by one of these two concepts. And then finally, we see cost benefit analysis. Uh, we're gonna measure both cost and outcomes in monetary terms. So sometimes measuring outcomes in monetary terms seems quite straightforward. You know, If you can treat a child more effectively for myopia and they need to see their eye care provider less, we save money, that's easy. If we treat the child better for myopia and they avoid um, uh, retinal detachment later in life, other than this concept of how do we count those costs 20, 30 years down the line, that's easy. If we're gonna say, well, you know, we maintain their myopia at a lower level than it would have been otherwise, and they don't need glasses as often, and we keep them with their right prescription more of the time, and that affects their ability to be productive, how do we measure that productivity? And not that it really relates to mortality, but if it did, how would we measure, measure mortality? So on the one hand, if we can all agree on how to put a monetary value on these outcomes, and even economists don't always agree, but if we could all agree, then it's easy to say that the decision maker, here's the value of what has to be spent, here's the monetary value of the outcomes, the monetary value of the outcomes is bigger, so this is worthy of consideration. And if it's smaller, then again, from a purely economic point of view, you don't consider it. The challenge, though, is getting everyone to agree on how to put a dollar value on health-related outcomes beyond just saying, again, that we avoid medical care spending. Other terms that we see when we're looking at things related to um, cost-benefit, cost-effectiveness, and a business case for things, uh, we often worry about uncertainty. Yeah, you know, I've spoken thus far as if we know exactly how much productivity is lost exactly what the probability of certain things happening is. Uh, and we don't usually, and how do we reflect that uncertainty and how much uncertainty are decision makers willing to tolerate in their decision making? Um, obviously, you know, in terms of business, we think about markets. Is there a market for this? Is there a, a role for private industry to play or is it always going to have to be the government organizing interventions? Is the business gonna be self-sufficient if it tries to enter the market? And can we yield a situation in which more patients are self-sufficient because of maintaining their vision? When we think about businesses, we're always thinking about what's going on at the margin and is the business able to make an operating profit? Is the business able to make an overall profit? Is it profit that's going to be distributed to shareholders or is it profit that's gonna be reinvested because it's a not-for-profit organization? But clearly being concerned with, are we, drawing in more revenue than what we're spending is important for any business. A business case, you know, can we make that case that private industry and private investors or private healthcare providers have a role to play? And can we get, <clears throat> give them an incentive to enter the market and stay in the market over time? And then obviously when it comes to things like pharmaceuticals or medical devices, there are intellectual property issues as well all of which can affect the interest in coming into a business, the willingness to stay in a business area and the willingness to invest for the purposes of innovation so that we can better care for eyes, keep vision, uh, maintain vision and care for eye health. So I wanna comment briefly on a few studies that I've been involved in recently and then talk about some of the future work that I have going on. 
So published just uh, within the past year, uh, although it was uh, accepted. So Kevin, uh, yeah. there is a question. Do you want to take that up? No. Sure. How do we tackle a health? Uh, so it's in the chat box. Yep, I got it. Uh, health burden expected to rise in the future, but may not be that serious at present. So that's a great question. Um, and uh, I think, you know, when we're looking at things where the burden may rise in the future, uh, you know, one real key is how, how good are the epidemiological models? And this is where, you know, epidemiology and economics really come together. Uh, and, you know, in that title that I had at the beginning, the business and economics of eye care and health, uh, I will occasionally write it uh, as, you know, B-E-E-3-C-H, because I like to think about economics, epidemiology, and ethics. They all, they all are important in making these decisions. Um, and, you know, to a degree, the question gets at ethics. You know, if we have some knowledge about something that's going to happen in the future, how do we incorporate that into our decision-making. Um, and with uh, Brajesh's question, you know, if we have good epidemiological projections, if we know something is coming because of an aging of the population, if we know something is coming because we can predict what's been going on with diabetes in our population, um, if we know something is coming because we can predict based on changes elsewhere around the world, what's gonna happen with myopia in our population, then, two things you can communicate to decision makers. One, in a purely year by year, what I referred to earlier as cash flow or just resource flow way of describing things. Well, this year it's only at, you know, $1 million, but by 10 years from now, it's going to be at a billion dollars. That's worth taking notice of. Um, you can also do this present value type of calculation. But I think that in this case, I would be much more interested in saying, uh, you know, here's the absolute amount, and even more importantly, here's what percent of our GDP it's accounting for now, and here's how much of the GDP it would account for 10 years from now if we don't do something about it based on our current projections. And then, obviously, in that case, you'd also have to be able to answer the question, well, what do we have the capacity to do about it, and can we change the, uh, the economic impact over time? So I think, um, and this is also a place where we can represent uncertainty. How certain are we about those epidemiological projections to say that the you know, prevalence or incidence is going to go up, you know, double, four times, 10 times? Um, and if there is good reason to think that those epidemiological projections are, in fact, accurate, then bringing that to the decision makers' attention is quite important. So that was a great question, Rajesh. Uh, Samir sure. also seems to have a follow-up question. Sure. Uh, yeah, thanks, Kevin, for uh, giving us the different types of analysis that can be conducted. But all, all these costs analysis uh, on eye care or any other uh, area uh, varies on the perspective that is followed, like a societal perspective or a self-pay or pair perspective. Now, in a self-pay market like India, uh, some of these analysis may get preference over the others, you know, because of the uh, self-pay specifically. Any comments? Uh, any any comments from you uh, on on the perspectives that should be followed, or uh, which analysis get a preference? Yeah, that's a great question, Samir. And I know in the United States, we've been debating this ever since the first panel on cost effectiveness in health and medicine published a book back in 1996. And they said, oh, well, everybody should do the societal perspective. Well, from a scientific point of view, the societal perspective is ha has some things going for it. Because if everybody did it and everybody did it exactly the same way, then you'd have, at the very least, you would have uh, methodological consistency, which is a wonderful thing to have. It makes studies much more comparable with one another. The challenge is uh, I've met very few people, government or really anywhere, uh, who actually use the societal perspective for decision making. And so um, when, they, when they did an update to their book about uh, two decades later, I think it's been about six or seven years now since they published the follow-up to the panel on cost effectiveness and health and medicine text, you know, they, they basically said, you know, in all likelihood, you've got a funder uh, for this research. And at the very least, do the analysis that the funder is most interested in, as well as societal. And what I like to tell people is, well, you've got your funder, you've got societal perspective, 
but there's two perspectives that you have to figure out how to at least comment on, even if you don't do a full-fledged analysis. One of those is the patient, because whether you're in a self-pay system like India, or even here in the United States, where you know many people are insured, although even with the Affordable Care Act from the Obama administration, we still have a between seven and 10% of the population who's uninsured and who has to pay for their own. And even among people who are insured here in the United States, uh, medical expenses are one of the leading causes of, of people declaring personal bankruptcy. So even here in the United States, we have real costs that people have to bear. And so it's a long way of saying, I think you always have to analyze the perspective of the patient and really ask yourself, does this new opportunity, new intervention, new device, new drug, does it make sense from the patient's perspective? And at the end of the day, whether it's the government providing the resources, whether it's private insurer providing the resources, does it make sense for them? Because if there is a role for a third party payer and they're going to have to pay more, then they're going to have to decide whether it's how they're going to get the revenue to pay more and is it worth it? And your patient's going to have to do more. And then occasionally remembering that you know, is it making sense for the provider? Is the provider going to make more money or less money as a result of this? You know, for every study that we talk about here in the United States, where, oh, well, if we can keep Medicare patients out of the hospital, well, that's great for Medicare. What happens to all those extra hospital beds? You know, what do we do with those? And so, you know, I think that, um, you know, at the end of the day, to the degree that we have the resources and have the data, um, have the time, to do separate analyses and ask ourselves, you know, does every stakeholder who's involved here, are they actually better off uh, with this new opportunity or not? I think it's an important question to ask from as many perspectives as possible. Thank you. Oops. Yep, thank you for the question. Okay, let me touch on, like I said, a few of the few of the studies I've done and a few I've got coming up. So, um, this study was with uh, Kristen Eckert and Van Lansing uh, and Marissa Carter, and it was a follow up to an earlier study. Uh, you know, I've, I've done a lot of work on on again this global burden concept and however we want to phrase the productivity loss issue. But what we came up with was a relatively simple formula. Uh, for the first study, there were two extra steps of complexity. We made it even simpler uh, for this follow up study. Um, and basically with data just on the population 50 years or older, which is easy to find, uh, the crude prevalence rate for individuals 50 years or older, um, which uh, you can find through the International Association or Agency for the Prevention of Blindness, uh, GNI per capita, which is easy to find for most countries through the World Bank, uh, and then an adjustment factor that's based on things in the literature, you can calculate on a global basis, on a country by country basis, you can do it to WHO regions, uh, you know, what the productivity loss due to blindness is. And this is um, with this relatively straightforward formula and some work, I'll go to the next slide, that uh, IEPB had asked us to do uh, with this. Oh, went too ahead. There we go. Uh, for this year's World Sight Day, they wanted us to do some subset analysis on global productivity losses due to avoidable site loss. Uh, and we looked at uncorrected refractive error and cataract surgery, uh, particularly uh, cataract surgery that was uh, delayed or not going to be done for a variety of reasons. Uh, it's relatively straightforward. I don't want to say simple, but relatively straightforward to work with the existing formulas and the existing data and plug some new data in. And I'm hoping that something that we've been talking about for more than a decade, which is to have an annual update with whatever new census data is being put out um, you know, by the UN or other agencies to give the 50 plus population on a country by country basis, uh, working with IAPB whenever they get new data for new estimates of the uh, crude prevalence of blindness and vision impairment, uh, moderate to severe in these countries. Uh, the annual updates that the World Bank will do for GNI per capita that we can update this year by year and working with IAPB, get this into a format that can just, uh, you know, literally provide the latest data on a year by year basis rather than only updating it, um, you know, once, once every five years or once a decade, which we had done previously. 
Um, I see that uh, Naranyan has a question. Uh, so the ophthalmologic pharmacy market is smaller than the general pharmacology market. If the new drug molecules are designed specifically for ophthalmic needs, how do we get investors interested to help us get the module uh, or the molecule rather to the market? And do we need to extend the application to other diseases? Um, you know, I think it's interesting. A um, couple, couple issues on that. I mean, clearly there are, are some things. I always, I always think of the age-related macular degeneration treatments, right? So, uh, you know, Avastin uh, was originally a drug for cancer, and it, you know, then was used in the ophthalmo ophthalmology space. Um, you know, I think that one of the things about ophthalmology is that while uh, it may be, uh, it may be. According to this parameters, I should get. But before that, I'll explain what other things we have. Well, <laughs> well, maybe it doesn't. Uh, in any case, I'll continue answering the question. Well, maybe it doesn't affect everyone. This point, while measuring, we have a distance measurement as well. Look at this particular uh, uh, We have B one for the distance sixteen mm. Yeah, extremely sorry about that. Sorry. That's no, okay. Yeah. Uh, these these things happen on Zoom. Um, in any case, I, I think you know uh, part of it is thinking you know is it a condition where it affects a large portion of the population? Um, you know, AMD for older adults is actually fairly high level of incidence. Um, you know, I think the other thing about vision is that people are often willing to pay quite a bit. Again, realizing that that quite a bit means something different in different countries. But uh, given the, the value that people give to vision, um, yeah, obviously it's gonna be on a case by case basis whether it's enough, but I, I do think that there is room to charge quite a bit in many cases. Uh, there are some eye conditions that affect quite a large number of people. Uh, and so, you know, it, 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 it can still be difficult to get investors interested, uh, you know, particularly given the rate at which molecules uh, new chemical entities actually get turned into useful and profit-making uh, pharmaceutical products. Uh, but it's uh, there's definitely information that, that can be used, I think, to just uh, just focus on on the ophthalmic pharmacology side, at least to start with. Roger, I see you have a question. Yeah, hi. So that was my namesake probably there, uh, Narayanan, who asked the question. Uh, I just wanted to add what... Uh, Professor Kevin Frick has mentioned here about Avast and um, in the U.S. Um, Medicare spend, if you see in the year at least 2020 data, the top three drugs uh, by spend among all specialties by Medicare, three of them were ophthalmology and all three were retina, uh, rightly Guess probably uh, it was um, aflibercept, that is Ilia, ranibizumab, lucentis, and then Avastin. Now Avastin is difficult to uh, dissect out whether it was for oncology or ophthalmology. But uh, I would say a lot of investors are looking in ophthalmology because uh, it, it, it uh, is uh, very highly, um, uh, there is a very high return of investment if if a drug succeeds to get uh, approval, especially for chronic retinal conditions. So there is a lot of interest, but as the question uh, is there, it's, it's if you look at the ophthalmology market, maybe by volume it's small, but if you look at revenue, uh, it's a huge return of investment. Uh, but yes, there are drugs and there are indications where you would like to extend it beyond what it is available in other uh, indications. I would say, but there is a lot of interest from funders in ophthalmology. Yes, Aninda. So I just uh, wanted to uh, ask Kevin a question in this regard, uh, purely from an economics perspective. So there is this whole idea about, uh, in economics, there is this whole idea about uh, directed technological change uh, by Asimoglu et al. Uh, uh, right, Darren Asimoglu's that growth theory idea that uh, market size determines the direction of innovation because smaller market size typically leads to uh, lesser return and therefore investor uh, so innovators do not want to innovate in that market. So which makes the technology 
kind of being captured by market size. Do you see that happening in this present context or it's not necessarily, I mean, I know that Dr. Raja just gave an example that maybe I care is, you know, one counter example to that, but broadly, do you have any overarching theme about how uh, the growth theory kind of proposes something very different than what we are seeing here? I mean, I think uh, obviously bigger markets are, are you know easier to attract investors to. I think you know there there are so many ways in which a drug could be a blockbuster drug. You know, when we think about pharmaceutical products, and again, I'm thinking largely U.S. market, but uh, I'm sure that you know when drugs are blockbusters, that, that also is reflected in other places around the world. Obviously, part of it is the is the incidence, but part of it is how much they're spending. And to go back to uh, you know the the previous comment, I mean. The reason we're spending so much on Lucentis here in the United States is that, you know, at least originally, it was two thousand dollars per dose once a month for an indefinite period of time per eye. Uh, you know that that had uh, that that needed this for the treatment of age-related macular degeneration. That's um, that's a lot of money, and so you know I think that you know and and. Moving out of the pharma into the biologics, we see things for which the markets are not necessarily very large, but the potential, uh, you know, price tag is extremely high. So, you know, I think that it's always important to remember when we're looking at investment, it's a question of what's the expected revenue from this investment. And that revenue is going to be a function of how uh, many people have the condition, how often and for how long the drug needs to be given. Of what's the unit price per drug? And so obviously, if you have a great big market, that helps. And then you don't need to have as high of a price or as frequent of a dosing. Uh, but you could have a moderate to medium sized market with a frequent dosing and a very high price that could still provide quite a quite a large return. So I think it's just important to always remember, you know, what are the the three things that determine revenue? And, and those are and if obviously it's great if all three of them are big numbers. Uh, but sometimes, you know, one, one or two are big and the other one is just OK. And then that 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 can change the uh, the uh, the answer. Um, was it that helpful? Great. And I see that uh, Sonny has a question, an opinion on the use of models such as Markov modeling to look at long term effects for a particular disease or intervention, specifically when there's a limited availability of data. Um, so, you know, this gets into, you know, some of the, the nitty gritty of the actual analysis, but it's a great question because when you look at papers in the literature, you will see that many people over the years have used Markov models or other models. And, uh, you know, as, as Sonny reflects in the question, you know, how good are the data? How good are the data on cost over time? That's important. How good are the data on the epidemiological transitions over time? That's quite important. And how good are the data then on the clinical impacts over time? And, you know, sometimes I've seen a few papers recently where, you know, I or other people looked at it and said, were they really ready to do that? Did they have all the data that they needed? And there's always this question about, well, if we could do something rather than nothing, is that good to get something in the literature? Um, I don't think it's always better. I think I want to have some minimum quality of the data or minimum certainty about the data. I think the, the challenge is, you know, particularly with a new pharmaceutical product or a new surgical intervention, people want to be able to project how that's going to play out. And you gave the opportunity, obviously, the example of uh, glaucoma and ROP. And glaucoma can affect people, you know, in mid-adulthood. Uh, and so if you're going to try to project an impact on somebody for the next 10, 20, 30 years of their life, how well, how comfortable and how confident can we be about those projections? Um, and it's on a case by case basis. We hope that the peer review process helps us to, you know, dissect, is this done well or is this not done well? And hopefully if it's not done well, it won't get published. And if it does, hopefully people will be, you know, appropriately critical offering constructive criticism as to how to make it better. I think the challenge is if you get a study out there that, um, wasn't done well, but came up with a really desirable conclusion, then sometimes it can be very difficult to dislodge that from people's minds, even if the study wasn't done that well. So in terms of the legitimacy of the methods, the methods are absolutely legitimate. The key question is with anything 
you know, when we're when we're building a model of the future is how confident are we about those data? And there are some data that we have reason to be highly confident about and others that we don't. And like I said, I think it's a, a matter of our peers doing the peer review process as well as when we read the literature itself to be um, appropriately reflective on the quality of the of the data going in. So I appreciate that question. Um, yeah, I think you have around 10 minutes from now. Yeah. And so what I'll do, I'll just touch on a couple things briefly. Um, just a couple other studies recently. I was working with uh, Brad Wong and some colleagues from SEVA looking at um, taking things to scale and really thinking about this issue of how do we take things to scale and what would be different about taking an intervention to scale in India versus other countries. And I think that as we think about international decisions, recognizing that what works in one country may or may not work in others, depending on, um, it could depend on the demographics, it could depend on transportation, it could depend on uh, even tariffs, you know, bringing things into a country, but just recognizing all of those uh, as important. Um, then um, uh, we were working on methods to estimate the effects of anti-myopia management options. Again, uh, looking at that in a very specific uh, set of uh, models moving forward. And then uh, a cost minimization analysis looking at um, ready-made versus custom spectacles with uh, some colleagues at the London School of Tropical Medicine uh, and Hygiene. And again, looking at uh, you know, different interventions that may work differently and have different values depending on uh, the country. And then just to conclude about sort of where some work is going, one of the biggest things is that uh, in the spring, I'm trying to get uh, some researchers together for a one day virtual symposium on this topic of the business and economics of eye care and eye health. Um, and what's fascinating about that is there's lots of conferences where people talk about that some you know, research conferences, ARVO and other things where you can talk about these issues, but I have not seen a full day dedicated to talking about these issues and really trying to bring together people who are doing the academic uh, research on economics related to eye care and eye health, either as an economist or as someone adjacent to economists coming up with some input data, but also to bring together uh, people from NGOs, people from industry and people from government to talk about these issues together. Um, recently worked on a study summarizing cost benefit analyses of cataract surgery and refractive error interventions. Um, why did we think this was important to do? Because you know, study after study supports a very favorable cost benefit ratio for these interventions. Um, and yet countries don't always invest. And so going back to the presentation I mentioned that I gave last week, how do we tell the story better? How do we engage people differently to really get them thinking about ways to bring economics into their storytelling and convince decision makers to allocate scarce resources? Uh, for treating AMD, uh, working with a, a colleague here who's trying not just to treat with ranibiz ranibizumab and bevacizumab, but to wean eyes off of it and to ask how much money does weaning an eye off of one of these two products save? And is there any risk that that creates for you know, recurrence of the condition? Um, I got a colleague here who's looking at machine learning in cataract surgery, particularly trying to improve uh, the quality of cataract surgery, getting people to a higher level of competence for everyone, getting people to the highest level of competence they can achieve more quickly, uh, and as my colleague said at our most recent meeting where we were discussing this, can we, you know, maybe we can't move the right tail because we've reached a maximum level of competence for some people, but can we get rid of the left tail and really make it so there's no one below a certain level of competence? And then from an economic and business point of view, can we predict who's going to need this type of intervention more clearly to use the intervention as, uh, as efficiently as possible? And then can we get private industry to invest in this? Um, economic impact of near task glasses. I know some people, uh, there was a study done by Nathan Congdon a couple years back on tea picking. There's another study being organized on coffee bean sorting. There's a company that looks at livelihood in general. But the key here is even, 
you know, the use of the term reading glasses, does that give people who may not use them most for reading, but may have great use for them, does it give them the wrong impression of why these are important? And you could even change the name to near task glasses be helpful. Uh, along with the, uh, the machine learning to improve cataract surgery, some discussions about simulators to uh, prepare for cataract surgery, uh, different costs. And I think what's really important is, uh, you know, in the environmental engineering, they also do what are called life cycle analyses. So, you know, what are the resources that are used in a traditional cataract surgery preparation program versus with a simulator? And does it even change the resources that are used and the resources that have to be disposed of? And then finally, some ongoing work. Uh, we've done some work in Baltimore. We've got some data from Chicago on um, screening primary school children in the United States for myopia and other problems with their vision. Uh, and in the United States, uh, here in Baltimore, we've sent people out to the individual schools. In Chicago, they sent kids to a centralized location. So we're asking questions that aren't so different from what's being asked elsewhere around the world about when you have an intervention that you're trying to apply to a population, do you send the people who are doing the screening out to the population or do you bring the population in to a, to a center? So those are some of the things that I'm working on, you know, always trying to apply the, uh, the uh, types of analyses, the types of thought processes, recognizing the use of resources, recognizing the use of resources, both time and physical resources, time for different types of individuals. Who do we need to train? What level do we need to train them to? Uh, and really trying to make a case that we can clearly communicate to government decision makers, NGOs, and private industry to try to attract more resources uh, so that people's vision can be maintained better into the future. Um, I know we have time for maybe one or two more questions if people have them. And I appreciate, again, the invitation to have had an opportunity to present this morning. Thanks, Kevin. It's a fascinating talk and lots of food for thought here. So, uh, we do have a few minutes, so if you have questions, please feel free to unmute and go ahead. So I had a question. Great talk again, Kevin. Um, uh, refractive error uh, is now known to be one of the major causes of vision impairment. I know a lot of countries invest uh, quite a bit in cataract surgery. But I wanted your opinion and thoughts on spectacle uh, dispensing uh, being brought into um, health insurance or government-funded programs um, as um, an intervention similar to, let's say, cataract surgery to restore vision impairment. Uh, so uh, I see uh, at least uh, in quite a few countries, it's not even covered under uh, health insurance scheme. Even an eye testing is probably a challenge for many of them. So what do you think are the challenges and how can we advocate for this, uh, that a simple glass is might be as effective or probably more effective than a high technology intervention for restoring vision? I think, uh, you know, there's lots of data that suggests that it has a good cost benefit for sure. And, you know, that, and then that can be a good cost benefit ratio for children in terms of enabling them to be, you know, have a higher educational attainment. It's a good cost benefit ratio for younger working age adults if they don't have appropriate um, spectacles for whichever near or far vision. And definitely for older working age adults who have built up you know, quite a bit of experience. And if they, I mean, I know without my reading glasses on, even my ability to see the computer three feet away from me, uh, you know, I'd have to squint to make out names and, and it would be a very different work experience if I didn't have this pair of reading glasses with me, you know, day after day after day uh, on top of the contact lenses that I wear for distance vision. So I think there's a lot of data there. I think, you know, what tends to, I mean, it's interesting, even in the United States, there's a different type of insurance for vision. It's not included in general health insurance in a way that we would expect. If you have an eye injury, yes, that's covered by general health insurance, but refractive error is covered by a totally different type of insurance and gets sort of set off to the side, very similarly to dental care. We do that in the United States. It's treated differently. Um, you know, and maybe it should be treated somewhat differently. Um, you know, it's not often, I mean, 
you know, the whole discussion about, you know, myopia, is it a disease? Is it not a disease? Is it just a condition? You know, what is the, you know, what is the definition there? And, you know, does it meet the same criteria? You know, it's a different thing to insure against in an insurance point of view than a heart attack or a stroke, which is a purely random event. But, you know, maybe what we really need to, you know, think about from a governmental decision-making point of view is simply, you know, there are things that are random, like the heart attacks and strokes and cancers of the world. There are things where we can invest in making people healthier. And this is an investment choice. So, you know, maybe it does or doesn't belong alongside insurance against, I'll stick with the three examples, stroke, heart attack, and cancer. But that doesn't mean that it doesn't belong inside of the government thinking about how to invest in the health of its population and how to invest in health in ways that will help to grow the economy over time. I think the other rate limiting factor is, you know, again, even in the United States, even to this day, we're still doing studies. What's the best way to do the screening? You know, what level of, of qualified people do you need? You know, a decade ago, we were doing a screening. Do you need nurses? Do you need, can you have interested lay people? You know, when my kids went to preschool, it was often a parent who would help them with the screening in the school. And, you know, I had to be the first to admit if I was asked to do something like that, well, I could help you, but I don't really know what I'm doing. And so, you know, what are those different methods to bring things to scale? And I think this is the this is the challenge, like that we haven't always figured out a way to bring things to scale in terms of the number of individuals, the number of facilities, the number of devices that would be needed. And then, at least in some countries, you know, perhaps not in India or the United States, but if we were to move to sub-Saharan Africa discussions, making sure that we can get the spectacles there, uh, you know, once the once the cases have been identified. So Kevin, just uh, maybe one more final question. Uh, I'm paraphrasing the question that is written on the, on the chat box, but I think roughly the question is as follows, that uh, if physicians themselves do not agree on how to evaluate quality, uh, what are the parameters for that? Uh, and they use different methods for evaluating quality, then how do we even come up with a number, estimated number for cost, which can be quality adjusted? And uh, th that's a question that uh, I think we're going to struggle with for a long time to come. I mean, in the, um, again, if you look in the literature of people who have tried to measure health related, quality of life related division, as I mentioned, you've got uh, some measures that just focus on vision, some that are vision in the bigger scheme of things, uh, and some where vision might be picked up in a bigger scheme of things measured, but is not measured directly. And then, yeah, I think the other thing to recognize is that um, even if we had an instrument that we all agreed on, uh, is that instrument equally appropriate all places around the world? Or once you had that instrument, would you need to say, well, here's how people in the UK respond. Here's how people in the US respond. Here's how people in India respond. Here's how people in Malaysia respond. And here's how people in Nigeria respond. And it could be five different responses in those. I mean, even for two countries like the U.S. and the U.K., which are not identical, but are probably about as similar as you can get, you know, for a very simple quality of life instrument, they found there were fairly substantial differences uh, in terms of um, in terms of how people rated different health states that could be described by the instrument. And so, yeah, I think uh, if we don't have a quality of life measure then probably the best thing to stick with is, you know, cost per case of blindness avoided or cost per case of severe vision impairment or blindness avoided. Or again, trying to turn it into some type of cost benefit measure where, you know, if it's taking, uh, you know, some measure of the medical care that people don't need when they're, when they're not uh, visually impaired or blind or the extra productivity and trying to turn it into a cost benefit analysis is another. Uh, another example. So I think that those are those are some ways of uh, of looking at that. Yeah, so that makes sense. There Essentially, were... I guess the takeaway is that one has to be realistic and not go for an ultimate utopian concept of what can be implemented right now uh, of, in terms of definition. Yeah, I, I think it's yeah. Just just really summarize simply: do the best study that you can, uh, right. and and make sure that uh, again. I think it's more. Once the study is done and published, assuming that it you know meets with the criteria to get published, 
then it's also important to think about how to take that and communicate it to the decision makers who actually have the resources. All right, so I think we had a great discussion. Uh, thanks, Kevin, and thanks everyone for joining us. So uh, Dr. Raja, I will turn it over to you. So if you have any final words. Uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Professor Kevin Frick for this wonderful talk. And uh, we learned a lot and look forward to learning the future too. And uh, we hope to uh, see you again in your webinar, which you are planning uh, early next year. And thanks for the invitation to us to participate in that. So thank you all once again for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.